welcome. Today I am chatting with Dr. Samantha Pfeiffer, who is a fertility specialist from Royal Cornell based in New York. Hi, it's so good to be chatting with you again today. Hello, it's very good to be chatting with you too. Thank you for having me here. Christmas, we did um, a brilliant Q&A, if you like, addressing people's concerns and questions, what's true, what's false, myths, facts, um, and just demystifying um, common concerns that people may have, which is is great. So thank you, everyone, for sending in questions. Uh, we have more, and um, it, they were very, very well received. And I know that people love hearing from you, Dr. Pfeiffer, so thank you for being here today. Um, so I will start with the first question. Yeah, there is a safe I mean. number of years to be on the pill. True or false? False. You know, I think the pill is very good. The pill has many advantages. It helps prevent pregnancy. It, it can suppress terrible symptoms people have with their menstrual cycles. Um, it can decrease the risk of ovarian and uterine cancer. So there's many, many good things the pill does. And the longer you're on that, the more of those benefits you derive. Um, the bad thing about the pill is people say, well, if you're on the pill, your cycle doesn't start up again. And that really is not true. It doesn't um, permanently damage anything in the reproductive tract. Sometimes when people are on the pill, they may have symptoms of a process going on they're not noticing. And when they stop the pill, their cycle may not be regular after stopping the pill, it's not necessarily because the pill, it could very well be the pill mass, something developing on their own. So. I can't get pregnant on my period. Sure. Oh, that, oh, that's a false one. That is a false one. I think, um, you know, when individuals or couples have intercourse, the sperm can live in the cervical mucus for a long time. And even if you have your period, there may be some sperm that are there. One could ovulate early. Um, so I think it's fair to say it's much less likely, but you it's not, you can't. That's, that is a definitive statement and that can get you in trouble. Okay, interesting, thank you. Because my period is regular, my fertility is fine. Is that true or false? That is false. There's, you know, it's nice that cycles are regular. Um, I think that's wonderful. We look for that regularity, means ovulation's probably happening and the system is working well. Um, but you can't assume anything. There's so many things that can impact fertility and that just reflects one aspect. So it's a good thing, but it's, it doesn't reassure you that everything is fine. Because I've had a successful pregnancy in the past, I shouldn't have a problem getting pregnant again. That's also false. I think, you know, secondary infertility can occur where I often see patients who like was so easy to get pregnant the first time they weren't even trying. And then they're having difficulty with the subsequent pregnancies and that can happen. Um, and I think anytime you see that situation, you have to look at every little thing. You cannot assume anything. You need to look at every potential cause and evaluate it. You know, I, I, my own family, my brother's 11 years younger than me. That was 11 years of secondary infertility. So, you know, I think it happens. Um, and it's unexpected. It's sort of, it takes people by surprise. So I think that I wouldn't assume that because you got pregnant quickly the first time, it would happen again. And if there's difficulty, you go look and see, could there be a reason? And it may just have been everything, you know, all the think factors were aligned and pregnancy occurred easily. Maybe the couple was younger or there other, or the, something may have happened in the intervening years to affect fertility. Mm -hmm. And that's something that people mention a lot in the community or just generally, it's kind of not always okay to ask why there might be an age gap or the timing behind things, because as you said, it could be secondary infertility or there could be loss or whatever that's, you know, happened. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's, um, it's always difficult to ask people questions of that nature because you don't want to put someone in an uncomfortable position to explain a bad event that happened. Um, 
but uh, secondary infertility is a real thing. And I, you know, I think that um, for people struggling with primary infertility, it's very difficult. And secondary infertility is also really challenging. I mean, yes, a couple may have a child or an individual may have a child, but there's no problem wanting another one. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's also very, very distressing to the individual, the couple. So it's something not to be taken lightly. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and also with secondary infertility, there's the kind of um, feeling of loss of time as well, probably thinking about the gap widening and wanting to give your child a sibling if you do, etc. Yeah. So there are added elements to it. I, I, yeah. I think there are, the other thing that I've, um, people have described is they feel guilty wanting another one. I mean, maybe this is not in the cards for them to have a second child and they feel guilty wanting another child, thinking that maybe that means they don't appreciate the child they have. So there's a lot of emotional things that are tied up in that. And I just like to reassure patients that, you know, it's okay to want another child and it's distressing if you're not able to do that easily. And we need to take care of this and help you figure out what's going on to okay. solve that problem. So it's a real thing. And I think it, the individuals who are, or couples who are struggling with that deserve a lot of support as well. You can recover from endometriosis. Is that true or false? I would have to say, what do you mean recover? I think uh, it can go away for good. Oh, it can go away for good. Um, sometimes it can. Um, sometimes it doesn't. Endometriosis is a very weird disease. In many ways, it's not very well understood. Um, you can have endometriosis and have terrible symptoms of the disease and yet have minimal disease, or you can have no symptoms at all or minimal symptoms and have terrible endometriosis um, seen at, at surgery or on imaging. So it's a very weird disease. There are studies saying that um, people can recover, it can disappear, it can go away, or the symptoms can abate. Um, and that certainly does happen uh, for many people. For some people, it's a continually progressive disease that they have to struggle with for uh, for years or for most of their reproductive life. So um, I have to say definite maybe on that one because it's not always true, but it can be. Okay, thank you for elaborating. Yeah. What about PCOS? You can recover from PCOS? True or false? Um, that's also a definite maybe. PCOS is also interesting. You know, I think there's different types of PCOS. Um, in a lot of patients who have PCOS, it may really give them significant irregular cycles and such when they're younger, but as they get older, those symptoms can lessen. And we see many people who have struggled to achieve a pregnancy um, and needed to take medications to induce ovulation, say letrozole or Clomid. And then after they have a child, it gets easier each time to the point that one of my patients actually who had moved away sent me a card and said, I have to use birth control. I keep getting pregnant now without oh your help. It, we see that sometimes. Oh. But then there's other PCOS that can be um, just very difficult and can persist. So I think we recognize as many different types of PCOS and we haven't figured out if they're all part of the same process or if there are different causes for each of these subtypes of PCOS. But for some people, it is a progressive disease that can be very debilitating and does not improve over time. And for others, it can get better with age. So it, it's a, um, I don't think it's a uniform statement that applies to everybody with PCOS. Men. Okay. Wearing tight boxer shorts harms sperm quality. Um, potentially, yes, it could. I think that, you know, I always say the testicles are outside the body for a reason. They like to be cooler. And so by increasing the temperature around the testicles, you may potentially decrease sperm quality. It may affect motility, um, maybe production. So, you know, if someone is having difficulty achieving a pregnancy, um, not having anything that would increase the temperature around the testicles could be beneficial. So, you know, hot tubs are not such a great idea. Um, individuals who have professions where they're continuously sitting 
um, even on a heated seat, that can be potentially an issue. So um, in couples that have infertility, that may be an issue. But there's many people that have those professions or wear you know, tight boxer shorts who don't have difficulty. So it doesn't apply to everybody. Um, but those are things we think about in couples who are struggling to achieve a pregnancy. Okay. Uh, cycling and sperm. Um, true or false that cycling affects sperm quality? I think in general, probably not. Um, but it potentially could, depending on the duration of cycling, again, the temperature around the testicles. So that could potentially be an issue. Um, it only sort of arises when people are having difficulty getting pregnant because many people, it is not an issue. So I think we only um, look for that in people who are achieving pregnancy and having difficulty um, and maybe having a semen analysis and showing that the motility is down or sperm production is down. That's one of the things we say, maybe that should help it a little bit. But I don't think that uh, we should assume that anyone who cycles a lot can't get pregnant. Um, I presume if you see patients who sort of over-exercise, the advice might be to slow things down a bit. Is that generally what might happen? I think um, for men or for women or both. I guess for both, really. Yeah. I mean, for women, if there is a lot of exercise to the point that they don't have regular menstrual cycles, that could potentially be an issue. Or if the um, excessive exercise is associated with disordered eating and low body fat um, and low energy intake or an energy intake, energy expenditure um, disequilibrium, then that potentially can be an issue. Um, so that is something that we have to navigate. For many people, exercising helps keep them calm. And you know, embarking upon trying to get pregnant and having difficulty is a very stressful situation. So you have to balance what natural resources the individual has to remain calm and reduce anxiety with that. So sometimes reducing exercise can be helpful and sometimes it can be detrimental. Um, for men, again, it, it really depends if their sperm is abnormal and there's adverse effect, then what type of exercise is being done? Is it increasing the temperature around the testicles? I mean, how does that all sort of figure into it? Um, and is there you know, the equivalent of an energy deficit disorder where the hormone production may be suppressed to, to some degree and that is also may play a role? But that's usually in um, elite athletes and, and potentially people who are um, lean. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it would really a hormonal evaluation would help to determine if the degree of exercise is so excessive that that could impact um, hormone production, okay. and sperm production. Yeah. Thank you for that. Pretty rare. I mean, with the Olympics recently, it's sort of on one's mind. Yeah. Definitely. Men are as fertile in their 60s as they are in their 40s. Is that true or false? Probably true for the majority of people. Um, I think as men age, there's a couple things that happen. Um, hormone production may be less, sperm quality numbers, motility may be less. Uh, for many men, there's an element of erectile dysfunction that occurs as they age. So those things certainly can impact um, ability to get pregnant. Um, the other thing that happens with men who are older, usually over 50, but sometimes over 40, there is a higher chance of having uh, issues like autism in the, in the offspring. Yep. So I think there's two separate um, thing components to that. Not so much chromosome issues, but certainly there may be um, sperm quality issues um, and related to age and then uh, risk of autism and non-chromosomal disorders. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those things can certainly happen. But you know, for many men, they're making enough sperm to achieve a pregnancy relatively easily. So it, it's not a not everybody has an issue. And the other thing is that if you have a man who's, you know, older, if you will if that man's partner is older, there may be difficulty on the female side. So we have to remember that, you know, it takes two to get pregnant and we have to look at the male and the female in the component. Definitely. Aphrodisiacs, increased chances of getting pregnant, like oysters, strawberries, etc. True or false? False. Um, 
false. They may increase one's desire to have pregnancy. The more you have sex, the more likely you are to achieve a pregnancy. So I, I think that um, they don't improve fertility, so to speak. Um, I should see a fertility specialist six months after trying to conceive naturally. True or false? True for someone over the age of 35, really false for someone under the age of 35. I mean, you know, we know that in, um, in women, the chance of conceiving in the first year for couples, if the woman is, um, is usually younger, about 80% of couples will conceive in the first year and about 90% will have conceived in two years of trying. In a woman who is over 35, there's inherently less time um, because fertility declines after the age of 35. And so um, if a woman is over 35 or even 35, if they haven't achieved a pregnancy in six months, then we think it's a good idea to come in and just have an evaluation to look for potential causes that could be treated. Because you'd hate to have someone you know, wait a year find out that the tubes were blocked or there's a very low sperm count or something of that nature that you could intervene and fix. And now instead of being 35, the woman is 36 and their you know, fertility is declining uh, fairly rapidly um, in the late 30s, early 40s. So you want to, um, you want to help those individuals a lot sooner. Mm -hmm. Do you see a mixture of patients in terms of the length of time that they've been trying to conceive? Yeah, it's just kind of interesting. So in New York, we have a lot of people that are coming in very soon. And a lot of a lot of young couples are coming in after not even really having tried very far, just like, I want to make sure that everything's okay. And um, there's, you know, I think that that's not unreasonable. You know, I, you don't want to find out you've been trying for six months, and you wouldn't have achieved a pregnancy anyway. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something to be said for doing some basic um, assessment to make sure that there's a uterus, to make sure that uh, you know person or woman is ovulating, to make sure that there's sperm. So I think those things can be reassuring. And then you kind of relax and say, okay, knowing this, we can try. Um, but I think certainly um, in women over 35, I think stepping in sooner than later really is a very, very good idea. Mm -hmm. But there's been a paradigm shift. You know, when I was first in practice, we would have people coming in saying, oh, we've been trying for seven years and nothing's happened. And it's funny how over time with um, people becoming much better informed about this whole process and aware that fertility is an issue, and also couples who are waiting later to get or women who are waiting later to achieve a pregnancy, um, you know, people are coming a lot sooner, which I, I think is good. You have to balance that with you know, becoming too aggressive too quickly. Yeah. Um, there's something to be said for benign neglect. If you don't do anything, it'll happen naturally on its own. But I think um, you know, finding that balance so that you intervene when appropriate and don't have someone trying unnecessarily for a prolonged period of time and they wouldn't have gotten pregnant anyway. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a balance. Yeah. I had to literally drag my husband to have a fertility test with me um, we had it at different times on the same day, but um, in London after six months of trying because he just said, you're being ridiculous. <laughs> um, but actually unraveled so much more um, and we then needed the help. So I'm so glad that we did it at that stage purely because I was 30 at the mm -hmm. time. And yeah. it just meant yeah. that we were informed. It wasn't great news at all, but at least we were able to do something about it. And intervene. I think, I mean, it does make a lot of sense. Um, and I, I think that it's often people forget that the male partner is part of this. And they assume, you know, just the woman is responsible. And, uh, you know, it, it really need to evaluate both partners. And men find doing a semen analysis um, difficult for many men. So it can be a um, something that a lot of men are not very comfortable jumping and volunteering for yeah sure i'll do that now so mm. you know i think that it's it's a good reminder that having both people evaluated is important um, and at the right time you know definitely okay. yeah diabetes causes infertility true or false severe diabetes can it can really um, affect yeah if people are really ill or um, have disruption of the menstrual cycle, yes. I think that we are more concerned about uh, people that are controlled diabetics, no. 
I think that really they're controlled, that's fine. But one of the other things that's really critical is having controlled blood sugars in the first trimester. So we're not so worried about the fertility aspect as we are about fetal, an fetal anomalies and cardiac anomalies can occur in diabetics if the glucose control is, is or glucose serum glucose levels are poorly controlled. So for anyone who's diabetic, it is really critical to have very tight control of the diabetes prior to getting pregnant. Even for you know, people who are taking oral medication, um, some medications for diabetes are not advised in early pregnancy. So it's good to know which medicines you can and cannot take. And for some individuals who are not very well controlled on oral medications, insulin is actually advised before they get pregnant and really getting tight control. And it's to decrease complications during pregnancy. Um, and then also we really you know, have to be, diabetics have to be watched closely because pregnancy induces diabetes. So it can have gestational diabetes. So it can make the diabetes more difficult to control. So that's, that's one that is not necessarily fertility, but more um, fetal safety and health during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. What about antidepressants, cancer treatment, epilepsy medication? How does that, does that cause infertility? Is that true or false? That's like soup to nuts. So, you know, if you, some of them can. So if you break them down. So sometimes antidepressants can affect sperm. So we have to be careful with which antidepressant the men are taking. Antidepressants in women um, don't affect fertility. Um, most of those medications are, it's pre preferable the person not take them when they're pregnant. However, healthy mom, healthy baby. And if taking a woman off the antidepressants makes her, allows her to get very depressed or um, not be healthy, then she's much better off taking the antidepressants and the effects on the babies are pretty minimal. And there's some that are better than others. So I think it's good to consult with your provider to make sure that you know, you're on the correct medication to treat your symptoms and have less of an impact on um, fetal development. But some of the other ones, you know, cancer treatments. Um, cancer treatments, it depends on the cancer treatment, but a lot of chemotherapeutic agents, so uh, chemotherapy for most cancers can be uh, toxic to the eggs. And in high doses, they can even lead to primary ovarian insufficiency or ovarian failure. So uh, women who have had chemotherapy for some cancers most notably leukemias or bone marrow transplant for any cancers, typically do not have any ovarian function after the treatment because the chemotherapy or, and also radiation therapy can uh, damage the ovaries to the point where they do not function anymore. <clears throat> so these are things that um, we like to know about. In some cases, we will take eggs out of the individual before going through chemotherapy if you can. Um, and it depends on the cancer, you know, bloodborne cancers, we worry about taking eggs out because we could be, you know, also taking out cancer cells. We don't want to do that. Cool. And oftentimes with bloodborne cancers, by the time it's diagnosed, the patient is so sick, they may not be healthy enough to undergo an egg retrieval or a procedure to remove some oocytes from the ovaries. Mm -hmm. um, other cancers where chemotherapy is needed, we often have time to take, to take eggs out before the cancer therapy is initiated. And breast cancer is a great example. You usually have a window between the time the diagnosis is made and the chemotherapy is indicated or um, initiated for us to do um, oocyte cryopreservation or in young, younger individuals, take out a piece of the ovary and save it for the future. So chemotherapy, chemotherapy can be um, detrimental. Having said that, for things like Hodgkin's disease, oftentimes the chemotherapy has minimal impact on the ovaries. So there's some chemotherapeutic agents that are not as toxic to the ovaries as others. So it's important to look at the big picture. Definitely. So that's why we've really, over the years, lobbied the cancer doctors to say, hey, you know, now that people are surviving treatment for these terrible cancers and we have a good long term outcomes for many of these cancers. We're like, now we can think about the fertility. How can we preserve fertility in these people 
at the same time as preserving their life and, and letting them lead a healthy life, mm -hmm. how can we then allow them to have children in the future? So this is, you know, fertility preservation for cancer patients is a huge um, burgeoning new field in, in, uh, in reproductive medicine that has been very successful in allowing individuals to have kids after their cancer is in remission. It's the one thing that it really has, um, really has grown in the last many, 10 years or so. And it's a real thing and um, people are having great success with that. It, it gives hope. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. It really does, it's great, yeah. Um, what about epilepsy? I mean, epilepsy, some medications, um, some actually some um, antidepressants and some medications for epilepsy can affect other hormone levels and can upset the menstrual cycles. And some medications for epilepsy shouldn't be taken in pregnancy. So again, that's something to consult the physician with. Um, certainly controlling the epilepsy is a very important aspect. And so that's a discussion um, with the provider to see which medications are optimal um, and which medicines can be taken safely uh, mm -hmm. won't affect the menstrual cycle. My mother has epilepsy and it's well controlled, but she was very worried apparently when she was pregnant with me, her yeah. first child, um, not knowing that she was pregnant for a little bit about the yeah. medication she'd been taking. Mm -hmm. They didn't I mean, have any answers then. Yeah. I mean, some of them are better than others. I think, you know, we always worry about any medication the pregnant woman is taking and that we really, really want to be very cautious about that. But we've got a lot more experience with some medications are safer than others. And so, you know, being able to switch to a medication that's safer if possible is very good. And some medications that we were told years ago, you cannot take in pregnancy. Now people are saying, well, we have some experience and it may not be that detrimental. Um, so I think it's good to see what the latest update is on many medications. And, you know, for those individuals that have these diseases to consult with their provider before getting pregnant to be on um, ahead of the game with that. It's a real, yeah. yeah. Yeah, a lot of people asking every day um, for expert advice around the vaccine and for television as well. I'm sure you get lots of questions about that. Is it I mean, safe? Does it affect your fertility? It does not affect fertility. It really doesn't. So there's a lot of anecdotal stories out there, but none of them founded. Um, you know, we ASRM put out has been putting out guidelines, COVID guidelines for the last two years, and we just you know basically two years from when we started, we concluded and wrote our last document. So it's kind of been a, a, a journey, um, struggling with you know the lack of information in the beginning and then the advent of the vaccine. And um, the bottom line is it does not affect fertility. Um, there is no association with infertility in the vaccine. The vaccine dramatically reduces the incidence of COVID and or the severity of the disease of Somewhere to get, I guess, someone's to get COVID afterwards. So we're not seeing the death rates that we did before vaccination came around. Um, the booster shots do not cause fertility. They are very helpful to reduce the morbidity seen and the mortality seen with COVID. And they also offer protection for the baby. So there's, to our, per, you know, per, um, um, in our opinion, based on scientific evidence these vaccines do not harm people's chance of getting pregnant or carrying a pregnancy successfully. And they've certainly offer an advantage for being a healthy um, mom and a healthy baby. And the same for men, it does not affect sperm. There, there's no evidence that it does. And there was some early thoughts that the vaccine would affect um, placental and attack the placenta. And that was based on a partial truth that the COVID virus and the placenta have a protein that has similar components, but the components that are similar <clears throat> have nothing to do with the uh, antigen antibody reaction. So the vaccine does not attack um, that portion of the virus and so it doesn't attack the placenta. Yeah. So I think that we've you know, really learned a lot that these vaccines save lives. They don't prevent conception. They don't prevent fertility, you know, people getting pregnant. Um, it's a really important message, yeah. Having sex every day is good when you're trying to conceive and increases chances of getting pregnant. Is that true or false? That's false. I think it also makes you tired and grumpy. I mean, that's, that is a tall order, have sex every day. 
I think, you know, for some people- And also if you don't know how many months that's going to be for. Oh my gosh, you don't know. Or, or for people that don't know when they ovulate, I mean, they could be having sex every day for 21 days. That, yeah. <laughs> that's, I mean, that is a setup for failure because um, you know, if you don't reach that mark of having sex every day, then you feel guilty that, oh, we didn't get pregnant because we didn't have sex enough. And then it just leads to negativity. And then all of a sudden this having sex becomes a chore and it's, it's associated with work and failure as opposed to be, you know, it's supposed to be an expression of joyfulness. Mm -hmm. love. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, we do not recommend sex every day because that's very hard to maintain. Um, you know, many couples, both people have jobs outside the home, may have two shifts there, you know, it's really hard to, to come home and actually have sex on a regular basis. Um, I think that we recommend sex every other day because that's a, that's a goal that is somewhat achievable. Um, so that is recommended. For some people having sex every day, we worry, could that deplete the sperm concentration? Um, I think, you know, sperm production is supply and demand. Um, but most of the time, the men are able to make sperm at the pace to keep up with that. Um, we often find that in men who have a very, very low sperm count, we need to have them give two samples in a day. We often re you know, find that the second sample given an hour after the first sample actually has a higher concentration of sperm. Um, we think that uh, having sex every day may in some cases deplete the sperm count because um, the production may not keep up with the demand. So I think that um, having, I think a goal of every other day is more reasonable. Um, certainly leading up to and including ovulation, we typically tell people sex every other day for the week leading up to ovulation and including ovulation. And then you can just have sex for recreation as opposed to procreation. And it, you know, takes the pressure off and, and allows people to enjoy being with each other. Mm -hmm. So I think that quite the, answer is it's probably false, but there may be an element of truth in some people, but it's just too hard to do. That's, that's a tall order. Mm -hmm. What about the time of day you have sex changes the chance of conception? Is that true or false? Whether it's the morning, lunchtime, evening? Well, interestingly, um, people are more likely to ovulate in the morning, um, naturally. Is that because they're well rested? I have no idea, but it, I think it often comes out that way. And then um, I think that, but there's really is no time of day that is, you know, guaranteed to allow someone to get pregnant. It's any time of day is fine. Mm -hmm. Sperm falls out when you stand up after having sex or you go to the loo bathroom. True or false? Well, active sperm falling out really kind of falls. The sperm that fall out are the ones that are dead anyway. And the majority of things that fall out after intercourse is vaginal secretions. So, um, you know, I think that sperm can be seen in the pelvis and fallopian tubes inside the abdomen within five minutes of uh, ejaculation. So sperm swims um, and moves through the reproductive tract very fast. When an individual, we recommend that after having intercourse, the woman lies down for maybe 10 minutes to allow the sperm to get where they have to go. But anything that falls out after that are sperm that are not moving, so they're not gonna get you pregnant and mostly vaginal secretions. So that's how I'd answer that one. So some sperm does fall out, but it's usually just the non-motile ones. Good to know, thank you. Within five minutes of ejaculation, you just said, you're pregnant. Is that true or false? No, absolutely not. No. So I think that fertilization could have happened within five minutes if that sperm bumped into the egg. But conception, it's how you define conception. So really, you know, when fertilization happens on the day of ovulation, it then takes that embryo about three or four days to make it to the uterus. And then another three or four days before it actually implants into the endometrium or the lining of the uterus. So it doesn't actually stick in the lining of the uterus till about six or seven days after ovulation. 
And that really is conception because you have an embryo that's actually stuck. So mm -hmm. it depends on how you define conception. I'm going to, well, <laughs> tell you about an acronym that I don't know if you know of it. It's very much in the sort of try and conceive community on, on Instagram, but Poopo, do you know what that stands for? I have no idea. I didn't know what TWW was either. So I'm clearly missing this lingo. What is that? Pregnant until proven otherwise. Ah. So people use P-U-P-O after a transfer, hopeful that they'll be pregnant within time until, you know, they have the result. I think that's a great idea. I mean, it was funny. I, um, I, one of my patients, I did her transfer and, and she's pregnant and she said, well, it's because you said to me, think good thoughts. Love that. Because I think you have to be positive, you know, because everything, it can work. And it's always good to be positive and cautiously optimistic and to think you're pregnant until you find out you aren't because that positive attitude, I think can be very helpful for your mindset mm -hmm. and can help get through that two week wait. Cause it's tough. Definitely. It's tough. Yeah. After, but I, I say that to people think good thoughts. Yeah. Um, after one of my transfers um, at Cornell, um, I sent you a message saying, um, I was so, I needed the loose so badly. I was about, you know, I needed the loose so badly. I drank too much water. Um, that's the right way around, isn't it? For the, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, you just replied saying, um, at least you didn't burst. And it just made me laugh. And I think humor at those sorts of times is really good. It's so, so hard. So a little bit of lightheartedness is always nice. I, yeah, I, always, I always tell people I've got good reflexes. If you end up peeing on me during the transfer, I can jump out of the way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, what are you going to do? And then the other thing is just don't make the patient laugh while you're doing the transfer. Yes, yes, yeah. exactly. Right. Although your yeah. colleague did say to me, I, I really, wow, you've really taken it to extremes with the amount you've drunk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, sometimes we actually have to pe make people empty it a little bit. <laughs> I'm not surprised. Yeah. Um, well, when you're conscientious, you just want to try and do what you're told. Oh, you know, one of the great things with, you know, taking care of people who are struggling with fertility and, and being along with them on their journey, it's the most compliant bunch of patients I've ever met in my entire life. You know, um, I think it's really, um, if you to ask them to do something, they will do it. And so it's incredibly gratifying that you actually can work with someone. You know, unlike some diseases, like for example, smoking or, you know, poorly controlled diabetes, sometimes you keep saying the same thing and the, and the patient is not able to, for whatever reason to follow through those instructions. Fertility patients are on it. Mm -hmm. And they usually yeah. are on it with like, well, what about this? Can I do this too? Because they've read about it. So it actually makes it all very, it, it makes it really fun and engaging. And you can actually have a discussion with them about you know, what's going on and why. And it's, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful exchange. That's, that's what I love what I do. I really do. And I, I get great enjoyment from, from this whole um, interaction with people that are interested in what's going on with them. Mm -hmm. I was just saying, you know, in this sort of whole being positive um, in cancer patients, those in a positive support group group did better than those in a negative support group. So I think that goes along with trying to introduce, you know, focusing on the positive aspects of things rather than the negative aspects of things. I think it's always helpful. So. Last question. Yeah. The better the sex, the better chance of conception. True or false? I think that's cute. Um, I, no, I don't think so at all. I mean, you know, I think, uh, it doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. If that were the case, you know, it's a terrible example. Um, and I don't mean to offend people, but, you know, people get pregnant after rape. Mm. And I'm sure that is not a good thing. So I think to say that, you know, and that's a very extreme example. And it sort of comes to mind of, you know, no. Um, and for many people, sex is not fabulous there's many people that for them sex is enjoyable but it's not the you know it's not the end you know the happiest place ever so i think that i think that can be um i've i don't think it's true um it's not it's not true at all for um 
scientifically either. I mean, if that were the case, we wouldn't get people pregnant with IVF and there's no sex involved in that. Mm -hmm. you know? So it doesn't make any sense to me. It also puts a lot of pressure on people. If you're not enjoying sex, then you're not going to get pregnant. And I don't think that's true either. Mm -hmm. I think optimizing the enjoyment of sex for both partners is a really important part of, you know, enhancing a relationship. It's a really important part of life. And we do this all the time. Many women have severe pain with intercourse and have great difficulty with intercourse. And, you know, helping them to um, overcome some of those things when we can treat them to help the couple have a more enjoyable experience is important for the relationship and for quality of life. But I think, um, I think that's really something that could be very um, discouraging to people. Mm. And I don't think there's any scientific truth to it. I mean, it's, it's emotionally charged, especially for couples who are trying to get pregnant. I mean, it's not that's just a say. pleasurable act or an enjoyable act. It's work. And, you know, it's really hard. And, you know, couples sometimes say, we're just taking it off this month. We're not going to have sex this month because it's so much pressure. We don't want to think about it. So it's an emotionally charged topic when it's not involving reproduction. Um, I think, you know, Hollywood has done a great disservice. You know, I've talked to many young girls who, um, after their first sexual experience, they said it was horrible and they didn't have an orgasm and, you know, and the movie stars on their first time having sex had an orgasm and it was the most fabulous thing in the world and it sets everyone up for disappointment. I mean, for many people, it takes a long time to figure out how to enjoy sex. So I think um, finding a way to make it pleasurable for those involved is really important, but it isn't, you can't say that the good sex is equated to better fertility. You know? Yeah, right so. on. Thank you. Enjoying sex is maybe allows more sex to occur, which then would secondarily help fertility. True. But I think it's not a it's not a cause effect relationship. Yeah. Great. Thanks for clarifying. Well, thank yeah. you so much for answering all these um, wonderful questions today and oh. time once again. It was I love all these questions. These questions are great because there are questions that uh, really deserve answers and are great to talk about. And uh, there's some misconceptions out there that I think uh, need to be clarified. So I love them. They're fun. That's great. On conception. Yeah, it's wonderful. Well, thank yeah. you for having me. It was so good to see you again across the pond. Thank you.